Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kara Provenzano from the MGA. I'm sorry I'm not able to be on camera today. Welcome to Tea Time with the MGA, the Metropolitan Golf Association, a webinar series geared towards women and initiative of the MGA's Women's Advisory Council. So the main mission of the Women's Advisory Council is to support women in golf in the Met area, specifically pertaining to education and development, as well as strengthening our connection with our female members and overall female part participation within our network of clubs. We are so excited to have everyone joining us today. Helping us produce this webinar series is Gia Levski, LPGA professional and founder of Golf Experiences with Her. Gia has spent over 25 years in the golf industry and is nationally recognized as a top professional golf instructor. She's also started Golf Experiences for Her as a way to strengthen relationships build comfort, leaving women feeling energized, enriched, and confident in their golf games. Without further ado, Gia. Thanks, Kira. Hello, ladies, and happy Thursday. Thanks so much for your interest in this year's MGA webinar series. We are thrilled to be able to round out this year with a very special guest to help us work through uh, a very challenging subject in our golf games, performing on the course. Dr. Allison Kurt is a dual PGA master and an, uh, and, and an LPGA master uh, professional teaching in uh, LA, California. As a specialist in sports psychology, Dr. Kurt helps golfers perform their best mentally and physically. She's recognized as a top young teacher by Golf Digest and a top teacher to watch by Golf Magazine. Dr. Kurt has won numerous teaching awards, including uh, the 2020 LPGA Western Section Golf Professional of the Year, 2019 SoCal PGA Professional of the Year, the 2018 SCPGA Club Fitter of the Year, a four-time LPGA Western Section Teacher of the Year, the 2016 SCPGA Teacher of the Year, and the National Teacher of the Year for the LPGA in 2015. She was selected as an LPGA Top 50 Teacher in 2017 and 2019 and was inducted in the SoCal PGA Teaching Hall of Fame. She currently serves as the LPGA Professionals Vice President and is Secretary of the SoCal PGA Board of Directors. Woo! Boy, do I feel under-accomplished. <laughs> she's not an amazing player and teacher, but she's a sweet friend. And we are so glad she will be with us for these next two webinars. Our ask is that you grab a pen and be ready to jot down a couple questions that may pop up during her presentation. We're going to hold all the questions until the end of Dr. Kurt's talk, and then we'll address as many as the time will allow us. And I know we have a lot to cover, so we're gonna dive right in, Dr. Kurt. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, G. It's so great to see you, even though we are coast to coast. Hopefully I'll be able to see you in person soon enough. But thank you so much for introducing me and bringing me to be a part of this program. What a neat idea to present these sort of lunch and learns, if you will, for the Metropolitan Golf Association. And I'm really excited to break up a little bit of my information into a two-part series. So hopefully we'll see some of you again next month. I'm talking about the mental game. And this is an area that a lot of students approach me about once they feel like they've got a good grasp on their physical skills, once they feel like they've got a good grasp on maybe their core strategy is really how to manage themselves. And so I'm going to start off with a little bit about how I've gotten to this place in my career, and then we're going to get right in into some skills that you're going to be able to use onto the golf course the moment you get out there and also use in your personal life. So great background from Gia, but I was working in a private club many years ago. And as students were coming to me, I was starting to realize that there was a lot of personal and interpersonal dynamics going on between teacher and student. And oftentimes, if a player was coming in hot after having a hot day of work and there was some conflict maybe going on at home, the lesson wasn't as successful. But if somebody was really calm and super focused and engaging, lessons were successful. And it made me think, gosh, there's more to teaching golf and more to helping players Play better than just learning the mechanics of the swing. And so I decided to go back to graduate school and get my master's degree in clinical psychology. And I became a licensed therapist in the state of California. So I'm a marriage and family therapist as well as a clinical professional counselor. And that really helped me understand my students from the inside out rather than only the outside in. So being able to work with them on how to hit the golf ball better and straighter was one piece, but the other dynamic that was really 
fruitful for me was to help them understand how they operate on the golf course. What are some of their weaknesses? What are some of their strengths? How can they handle adversity? What patterns start to emerge when they get into sticky situations on the golf course? Um, that didn't stop me because I wanted to become a doctor in psychology. And so I ended up getting that doctorate degree and specializing a bit more in sports. So how my day really works now is daylight hours, I'm teaching golf um, outside, and then evening hours, I have a private practice where I work with individuals across the globe, Australia, UK, US, and help athletes, not just golfers, that help athletes be their best and perform their best. So today you're gonna to get a little bit of um, tip of the glacier, if you will, on how to handle your emotions and knowing that anxiety is one of those things that impacts all of us. It's a, a natural core reaction for human beings, how to handle that anxiety. So as some of you may have already experienced at one point in your golf career, but there's a lot of different issues that impact your golf performance. One of my specialties is what I call athletic traumas. These are the things that happen on the golf course that stick with you. It could have been that missed putt to win the club championship, or maybe a highly embarrassing shot that shanked off and hit someone's golf course, uh, golf cart, and you felt mortified. These are the things that happen during performance that our brain holds onto, sort of in a PTSD type way, and then they impact our performances moving forward. So athletic traumas and adverse life events are certainly an issue that you may have experienced at some point. Communication between a team, a teacher, a caddy, family member. I see a lot of miscommunication between spouses when one spouse is trying to coach or teach another uh, person on the golf course, and particularly with parents and children. And that communication style can oftentimes be a hindrance to your performance. Whether you set goals or not can be a performance impactor. So having a clear direction on where you want to go with your golf game, whether it's just to have fun, break 100, break 120, break 70, having some clear set goals can really help impact a positive performance because now you have a map to follow, you have a roadway to follow. What we're gonna focus on today, emotional regulation, that ties into a lot of confidence, whether you feel like you are competent and confident to use certain skills on the golf course. How we concentrate. Uh, if you're the type of person who hits a shot and then you're back into your conversation with your buddy and then you send four text messages, check Facebook, and then all of a sudden you're back to hitting your approach shot, that might impact your performance quite a bit. So learning at how to improve concentration when you need it the most. And the last um, three are kind of all tied in together for that anxiety component, how to be able to control your body and relax in pressure-filled situations. Are you the type of person that gets super tense and you're really freaking out as you're heading to the first tee, which can lead into some anxiety-based disorders. You might've heard the term the yips before when players who normally can replicate a motor pattern time and time again, all of a sudden become frozen or locked up or create a, a really jagged type of a motor pattern. And using our brain to imagine and visualize how we would like our performance to go is really critical to improving our golf performance. If you haven't used imagery and visualization, uh, number one, it's free. Number one, it's it, number two, it's always with you in your brain. And number three, it's a guaranteed success to improving your golf performance. So again, knowing that we're gonna focus on emotional regulation today and some performance anxiety, the questions that I would want to uh, stimulate in you that you're gonna be asking yourself and doing some self-reflection is gonna help you become the expert on yourself. So knowing what kind of emotions show up in you and in what scenarios do they show up in you. We will learn about some container exercises. These are things that you can do to take the emotion, put a container around it, so now you have the ability to work with it and deal with it. Oftentimes our emotions become so big and very vague, but we know that it's impacting our performance. We just have no idea what to do with it. So to create some boundary around those emotions can allow us the empowerment to deal with it. We'll talk about some box breathing how to use our breath to calm ourselves, 
and the idea and power of mindfulness, being able to focus our attention where we want it at any given point in time. Now, what's interesting is these aren't just pertinent to golf and athletic performance. These are applicable to life. So if you have things going on outside of golf, then these will certainly help you in those arenas as well. As we move into performance anxiety, we'll talk a little bit about the first T jitters, the yips, and how those athletic traumas and adverse life events can impact your performance on the golf course and create the experience of anxiety. So let's dive right in. I'm gonna show you this short little video of this super cute golfer who I think is amazing. Air five greens, we know how frustrating those are. We just punched our greens yesterday at my golf course. He's feeling pretty confident about himself as he made that first putt and with a driver too. So that is just a load of talent right there. So as he's feeling like, maybe I'll move this golf ball a little bit back and try it again. Sadly, the success isn't as quick. And then all of a sudden we have an emotional breakdown. So hopefully none of you are experiencing that type of emotion on the golf course because golf is supposed to bring us some joy and pleasure. Remember that we do this for fun. But what are emotions? So emotions are purely information. You may think that an emotion just is created in your body and just all of a sudden happens. It feels automatic, but it isn't. It is actually a really complex dynamic in a split second of your brain interpreting the environment and then creating an emotion based on your past experiences that it thinks will fit the scenario. So based on the internal sensations you might have of missing the putt, based on your history of missing putts and your interpretation of what the missed putt actually means to you, you will then have the experience of an emotion. So it's incredible how quickly emotions can be created in our body. Uh, we look at our past experiences and what has happened um, when we haven't done so well. And our brain has these connections of all the times that we haven't done so well. And then all of a sudden this emotion is now created of anxiety, doubt, upset, sadness, maybe even depression based on uh, what we experience. So what's neat about emotions is because they are created, we can actually jump in on that level and influence the emotion to change it into something that is uh, easier to work with. So I don't play really great golf when I'm super angry and mad. I play great golf when I'm slightly fired up or we call that slightly aroused or when I'm really calm. So if I know that if I miss a particular putt in the past that would have created a certain emotion, I then have the power to jump in and change the path of what emotion is created. And so we are empowered to do that. In order to develop emotional regulation, we need to have an awareness of when it comes up and what does it look like in you. So when you think about anger, because that's something that's very similar to all of our experiences, what does anger look like in you? Is it something where your muscles start to get tight in your face? Maybe your cheeks become flushed. Maybe you're the silent type where you just stop talking. Or maybe you end up becoming more talkative because you need to have an outlet of that anger. So just notice in any type of emotion, happiness, sadness, doubt, frustration, what does it look like in you? And become a detective in, in how that shows up in you. Once we have an awareness of what the emotion looks like, so how Allison looks mad, how Gia looks mad, how Kira looks mad, we then have the ability to start to decrease some of the unpleasant sensations. So for example, tension is usually connected to some sort of frustration and anger, muscle tension in our hands and arms, muscle tension in our neck and our jaw. And so that's usually our innate response to try to hold on to the emotion and contain it so we don't explode and punch and, and hurt somebody. So the physical tension starts to increase. Well, we wanna decrease that. Certainly when a negative emotion shows up in our body, heart rate can tend to increase, or you may even feel your heart beating louder and more thumpy in your brain. So in your body, so being able to decrease those two sensations 
helps your brain start to interpret, oh, there are alternative emotions I could create and experience right now. And then lastly, we go into reframe. What does this mean to me? So missing a putt, does this mean that I'm a sucky, awful golfer? Or does it mean that my speed was off or my aim was off? One is subjective, one is objective. Subjective is all of the self-talk that comes up with, oh, I'm awful, I miss that because I, I'm a horrible practicer, I'm just not good enough. Objective would be the putter face was misaligned, the ball was traveling too fast, the ball hit an airification hole. Reframing the situation and asking yourself, what does this really mean to me? Do I need to invest all this energy in getting upset? Or could I use that energy and invest it towards the next shot and make that more productive? So one of the container exercises that I find extremely helpful, not only for performance, but in life, is being able to use this system to regulate emotions. So step one is being able to find where the emotion is in your body. So when you become angry, is it in your upper half? Is it in your heart? Do you feel anger in your hands? Locate where that tends to happen. Then apply a shape to it. So what might anger look like to you? Well, some of the common shapes that come up in the work that I've had with my students and patients has been um, usually something spiky, triangular, maybe like amoeba-like with all these spikes in it there's usually a pretty clear correlation between the shape and the emotion being experienced. So for example, when we look at where do I, where do I hold happiness, there's a lot of rounded edges. There might be circles for that. So create a shape that you feel like best resembles that emotion. And then assign a color to it. Anger colors tend to be uh, black to orange to red. Happy colors tend to be some yellows and um, hot pinks or sad colors can be some blues. Whatever color feels right to you, you now are starting to own the emotion. Where is it? What shape is it? What color is it? Now you can give it a name. It can be the name of the emotion, anger, sadness, frustration, or it can be a completely different name. And this is great to use with kids because they come up with some really interesting names for their emotions. Finally, you have location, you have shape, you have color, you have a name to it, you can own it. And what I mean by owning it is you can get rid of it if you choose to. So if I got really upset over a particular shot and I know that I have anger sitting in my collarbone that is orange and really spiky, and I'm going to call that frustration, then I can take a deep breath. And as I exhale, I can get that shape out of my body and use some imagery and visualization to now let it release from my body. Now, this may seem like, gosh, how am I gonna go through these five steps? But the more that you practice it, the quicker you can move through it. And in an instant, you can control that emotion before you say something that's unkind or you hit a putt that's only eight inches away and then you end up missing that just because you're filled with negative emotion. So very, very good container exercise for life and for golf. The next exercise that would be great for regulating any emotion that comes your way that you find unpleasant and you deem that you'd like to get rid of or control better would be box breathing. So in box breathing, we're going to regulate how we take in oxygen and how we exhale, which will then influence our heart rate and can also modify the tension in our muscles. So we're going to breathe in for a count of four, then you will hold your breath for a count of four. Exhale for a count of four and hold once again for a count of four. So I'd love for everyone on the call to try it with me and I'm just gonna hold up my fingers as we start to count. So we're gonna do a breath in. you'll find yourself really become grounded and settled with being able to control your breath. And this is something that's quick and easy to do in between shots, in your pre-shot routine before you hit a shot, while you're over a shot, anytime your spouse angers you with some coaching, 
before you give them a response, you can use this box accordingly. So I want you to take a look at this video from, gosh, this was 2020 Masters Tiger Woods. This was in the Masters, was pushed back to November during the COVID year. And you might've remembered on this tough 13th hole, a very interesting thing happened to Tiger, something that we really haven't seen before. In fact, we, we saw it for Jordan Spieth many years ago, I believe it was 15 or 16, but we didn't really see it with Tiger. So if you count how many balls end up going in the water, the first one was in the water, then the second one goes into the water. And as he takes another drop, he ended up hitting it over the green into the bunker. So the next shot goes into the water. And I want you to notice how he's composing himself. Is he slamming clubs? Is he hitting the sand? Is he showing any sort of physical display? Even though inside he was having a fantastic tournament, I'm sure he's fuming. This finished up with a score of a 10 for him. And I just want you to notice his composure walking pretty slowly. He's not fast picking up the golf ball. His cadence of his walk is still pretty slow. You could see some breathing happening. He scored a 10 on that hole and the next two holes went birdie birdie and still finished in the low 70s. So it is possible to manage really big numbers if you can manage yourself. Finally, going into mindfulness for handling emotions. We know that there's so many different distractions at any given time. Emotions can be a distraction. If you have ever gotten a hole in one before and you're super excited and really, really um, just celebrating with the group and all of a sudden you have to tee off on that next hole, you're already distracted because your mind is still back on that hole in one. We have water out of bounds. We have different hazards. We have playing partners, competitors. If you play at a higher level, you might have crowds or spectators. And then the experience of emotion, anxiety, or nervousness in particular can really distract you from the present moment. And the best definition for mindfulness that I have come across that was given to me in grad school was doing one thing at one time and knowing that you're doing it, which means if I'm hitting a putt, I'm only hitting a putt. I'm not thinking about anything else. That is my sole focus and I'm engaged in that process. That does not mean I'm hitting balls on the range with my headphones in, listening to a podcast, thinking about what I'm gonna make for dinner and what my schedule's like tomorrow. That'd be doing four things at once. So being mindful in the moment, understanding that your body is present and that your mind is present and that you're not in the past thinking about things that have happened, you're not anticipating the future, unless you're a fortune teller. Most people aren't really good at predicting the future. We were really good at staying in the present moment and just dealing with the things right here, right now. So if you're experiencing anxiety and nervousness, instead of trying to push it away, use a container exercise, be present with the emotion right now because it's information, it's telling you something about your environment. Become more aware, become more focused, become more relaxed. The emotion is giving you information about the present moment. And just be right here, right now, and handle that emotion, and it will start to move on. It does not have to stick with you your entire round. In fact, I use anxiety and nervousness when I go into big competitions as information to say, I care. There's a reason that my body feels this way, because I really care about this tournament. That must mean I'm alive. That must mean that I really want to do well. Cool, that's information. Now let's deal with it. I'll use a container exercise to let that emotion pass on so that it can be highly focused in the moment. So remember, be present by doing one thing at one time and knowing that you're doing it. Other ways for you to stay present when you're experiencing those emotions are to use a cue word. So you could pick a word that reminds you to come back to the present moment. It could just be here right now or focus. Every person has something that could, uh, a word that could be used to help them stay very directed and focused in the moment. So develop a cue word to help 
stay here right now. When you create and develop effective routines, that will allow you to stay present. A couple of years ago, I was playing in an LPGA major and I was asked by Golf Channel to show up at 6 a.m. and do a quick five, five to 10 minute tip for um, the morning golf news station on Golf Channel. And I was doing this with uh, President Susie Whaley, president of the PGA at the time. And so we start live TV, 6 a.m., no warm-ups at all, and we're talking about balls in the rough with a hybrid at KPMG, which is an LPGA major tournament. And I'm thinking in the back of my, me my head, wow, no warm-up, and I have to hit this ball out of the rough, and I've got Susie Whaley right here, and I'm on live TV, and everyone's watching the show on Golf Channel right now. How am I going to hit this shot? And Susie throws it down into the rough, and my body immediately went into my routine. So I stood back behind the ball, I did my pre-shot routine, my practice swing, my imagery, my visualization, my breathing, stood up to the shot and hit it great. When you use routines, not only in life, but in your golf, routine, in your golf performance, it will allow you to stay present. So everything else that was creating anxiety and worry in that moment disappeared because I created an effective routine. So I suggest and recommend that you create an effective routine for yourself. Take attention breaks. When you're playing a four hour round of golf, you do not have to be present on the golf course for four hours. You actually just need to be present for about 35, 40 minutes. Every little shot you hit, that's the only attention that you need to put on it. In between shots, you can hang out, chat, talk about stuff, look at the birds anything. Take attention breaks to conserve that energy. Understand what is in your control. Hitting a tree and having the ball bounce right out of bounds instead of left back in bounds is out of your control. It's already done. So remind yourself what is important now, which if you look at the first letter of each of those words, it is win, W-I-N. So ask yourself, what is important now? What is in my control? I can control my emotions, I can control my perception, I can control my routines, my breathing. These are things in your control. If you focus on those, those processes, your outcome will be better. Moving right into anxiety, something that we've all experienced. Ask yourself some of these questions. Have you ever had excessive worry or anxiety on the golf course? Do you find it difficult to control those thoughts and maybe they sometimes become rampant in your brain? Does your mind ever go blank or do you have difficulty concentrating? Maybe you experience muscle tension during that round of golf, dry mouth, racing heartbeat. Maybe your hands start to shake a little bit over some tricky putts or shots. Maybe an uneasy feeling in the stomach. You need to go to the restroom or you feel like you can't eat, can't drink. And do you maybe do these feelings of worry and, and these physical symptoms create so much impairment? that it's hard to hit the golf ball. Interestingly enough, if you have experienced these, this is the exact criteria from the DSM-5 of anxiety disorder, specifier performance anxiety. Now, that's not to say that every single person on this call has had performance anxiety before, but you may have. And it's not necessarily a clinical distressing um, experience where you have to go get treatment for it, but just to know that these are things that happen on the golf course and there is stuff that you can do to help combat it. Anxiety for us can be biological, it can be situational, and it can certainly be learned. So some of us do truly have biological anxiety where the chemicals in our brain are shooting off in ways that will create symptoms and panic and we just have no control over it, which can be controlled with medication. But in in off scenarios, oftentimes we have situational and learned anxiety. So we might experience a discrepancy between our skill set and the demand of the environment. So we may be a player who sh shoots in the high 90s and low 100s, and you're playing a particularly difficult golf course expecting to shoot in the low 90s. Well, that's a huge difference between what your skill set truly is and what the demands of the environment are asking. And so that discrepancy oftentimes creates anxiety. When we run through our past history of failures or embarrassment through our mind, getting up to the first tee and remembering the last time we topped it, 
or getting up to the first tee and remembering hitting it out of bounds in front of 18 people that were in front of us at the club championship. When we run those past histories of failure and embarrassment in our mind, it will start to create the anxiety and the nervousness that we try to uh, run away from. Certainly fear of the unknown, going into a tournament or playing a course that you've never played before, that not knowing can create a ton of anxiety. I know for me, just being the expert on myself, when I start to feel anxious, I ask tons of questions because I don't know what the outcome's going to be. When I get information and I ask lots of questions, then I feel super comfortable and then I feel like I can perform. Sometimes the judgment or the perceived judgment of other people can create that anxiety as well. What we think other people might think of our score. The reality is most people are so engaged in their own game, they really have no idea what's going on in your game. So keep that in mind the next time you feel, I think my buddy might, might think di differently of me if I shoot a really high score. They're so in, engaged in hitting their bunker shot out and their fear of judgment, if they blade it out, they're not worried about your score whatsoever. So if we can kind of keep that in check about the judgment of others, you'll find that that anxiety starts to decrease. Now, if this gets to a point where it becomes so overwhelming and so debilitating in our body, the anxiety can lead to choking. And this is when you have practiced the skill over and over and over, and you like really can't mess it up until you do mess it up. And then you're like, I just completely choked. I was five under going into the last hole of winning this tournament, and I ended up losing the tournament by two. That would be an experience of what we would call choking in, in, um, in performance psychology. So looking at anxiety and nerves before we start to wrap it up and take some questions here. Um, starting with what is it like in you when you get performance anxiety on the first tee over particular shots? Where do you feel it? Going back to that emotional regulation. Where is it in your body? Can you create a container around it? But know that anxiety and nervousness is your brain's response to its natural flight, fight, or freeze mechanism, which helps keep us alive. So implying it to golf, you'd say, well, I don't need to why is this mechanism starting up on the golf course? Well, it's a um, human, human reaction to an uncomfortable situation. Your body either wants to fight it, you either want to run away from it, or a lot of times people just freeze up. So knowing what it's like in you. And do you tend to get more pre-performance anxiety? So things that happen leading up to your performance or anxiety during the performance. Where does it show up? When does it show up? What does it feel like in you? Understanding that and becoming the expert in it will oftentimes help decrease a lot of the physical symptoms of it. And then talking about the role of pressure, we oftentimes put internal pressure on ourselves. We sometimes will have external pressure, especially in the parent-child relationship where a child might feel like they have pressure from their parents to perform a certain way. That role of pressure can oftentimes increase the anxiety and the nervousness. And so getting a really good grasp on what that anxiety feels like and what does it mean, that meaning can really make or break the experience of it. So I just listed out here what some of the common physical symptoms associated with anxiety might look like and some of the psychological symptoms the uh, feeling of being rushed or worried or just an overwhelm can create shallow breathing, rapid heart rate, erratic rhythm in your swing, shakiness or trembling, or even a tightness in your body. So just being able to identify those. In terms of building your anxiety toolbox, we have the deep breathing on command using our box breathing. But when you do deep breathing, if you put a hand on your belly and a hand on your chest, when you do deep breathing, your belly should distend and your, your lower hand should move out. If you're shallow breathing, you'll notice that your upper hand starts to move out. So understanding how to control your breathing by moving the lower hand, your belly, belly breathing, rather than the upper hand. Using your mindfulness um, components, understanding of being in the moment, even maybe getting into some practice of meditation, building your pre-performance routine, what are things that help you feel comfortable prior to hitting the shot? 
developing those keywords, that one or two words to help you redirect your attention. That can help anchor you in the moment. And then certainly creating more experience during your practice that allows you to practice with anxiety. So creating a situation where your heart rate is increasing and hit shots on the range. Trying to imagine being on the last hole winning a golf tournament and having to hit particular shots on the range. So putting yourself in vivo into those scenarios where you have the opportunity to practice the physical sensations of anxiety and experience hitting those shots. So build yourself an anxiety toolbox so that when you do experience anxiety, you are ready to go. So if you do have any particular questions about this presentation, we're gonna open it up for questions, but here's a couple of my social media pages. If you wish to follow, I oftentimes post a lot of golf content on my Facebook and Instagram, and then on YouTube, certainly post some golf, but there's some old presentations on psychology as well. So hit the subscribe button and certainly head on over to YouTube. As I mentioned earlier, I do run a private practice where I do work with athletes and golfers and individuals on their performance, performance and work performance on the golf course. So you're welcome to reach out if you wish to work with a sports psychologist like myself and um, work on some of the um, details of, of your performance and how we can help you become a better performer. So I know this is just the tip of the iceberg, if you will, of emotional regulation and anxiety, but hopefully this gets you thinking about becoming the expert on yourself, understanding a little bit more about emotions and how to handle that anxiety, building these toolboxes, building these strategies for yourself to handle these things so that when it happens, you are able to cope in the moment. Great, well, thank you for being such an awesome audience. And if we have any questions, we'd love to answer them now. I just realized I was on mute. Thank you, Dr. Kurt, that was amazing. Um, I have questions. Uh, I'm hoping some of the uh, our audience, our guests will have some questions as well. Um, so quick question, there's so much good stuff. I'm like, I don't even know where to start, but I know what I work with my students on, on routines and stuff. But you're, when you were talking about pre-shot routines, I thought that was um, something that's super pertinent and something that a lot of people don't practice, um, practice actually creating a routine. When you're teaching your students how to create a routine, do you let them, um, or does it become organic for them? Or do you give them, amount, tell them how much time they should um, take to create something or, or how, what's your approach on that? So I, I take it sort of like baking cookies. So we know in baking cookies, they're all going to be pretty much similar ingredients, some sugar, some butter, some oil. So we know that we have these ingredients, but the order that you put them in might be different than someone else baking cookies. So you might put butter in first and then I might put butter in after I put the sugar in. And so I share with my students the components or the ingredients of a pre-shot routine which would be things like information gathering, some sort of practice motion or rehearsal, um, an element of visualization, an element of deep breath, and then moving into the performance. And then I do have some suggestions on what would be a good order, but it's really up to the student what order feels organic and natural to them. So they might intuitively say, oh, well, gathering information seems like it fits before I do a practice move. So let's gather the information of yardage and wind and which club I'm gonna hit. But I really like to take a deep breath before I start my practice swing. So I need to take a deep breath first and then do my practice swing so I'm totally relaxed. So they get to build their recipe in the order that feels organic to them, but I do provide the ingredients on what would be um, certainly helpful to build the routine. And, and how that's great. And how long would you say they should work on something like that? If they were going out to practice and they had a half hour, in that, in that half hour time, they were going to work on a couple of things. How long would you say if you wanted to specifically work on a routine uh, to get comfortable with it? How long would you say that might be? Yeah, I think working on routines is sort of a lifelong endeavor. Like it, it might modify and evolve over time, but you always want to have um, that element of practice and not just use it on the course. So I like to look at practice in different types. So if they're working on a skill, there might be block practice where they're just doing the motion over and over and over. It would be okay not to practice your routine at that time because all your attention and energy is going towards that mechanic you're trying to improve. 
But when you're trying to use the swing as a performance, so now I want to try to hit this shot just like I would on the golf course, then you need to use your routine because that's what you would do on the golf course too. So in a 30 minute a span, you might spend 10 minutes on physical pieces, 10 minutes on um, preparing your routine and hitting shots, and then the last 10 minutes on performance using imaginative um, examples on the course so that you can actually practice what you would be doing out there. So I kind of break it up into that 10, 10, and 10 for a 30 minute practice. That's great. Um, that's great. And, and another question, uh, so if you're not a, a competition player and you just go out and you want to play with your girlfriends, right? You're going out, having a good time playing with your girlfriends, but you can't seem to, cause you were talking about the person that like, you know, hits some shots, goes back, gets on their phone, chat, chat, chat. There are, you know, most of these women, they want to be able to play a nice round of golf, right? They want to feel good about themselves at the end of the round. Uh, how there's so many different techniques that you just shared with us. What would be, I, I like the cue, like the word cue. Um, how, how would, you know, could you elaborate a little bit more on the word cue and how they might be able just to take, because I, I, that's just something that's so simple. Um, and that's obviously, you know, being positive and, and thinking about positive things to help you work through that golf round. What well, can you just elaborate a little bit more on the, a word cue? So the cue is going to help redirect your attention from where it doesn't need to be to where it needs to be. So if you're a recreational player and you've been chatting in the cart with your buddy and now it's time to hit your shot, you maybe could pick a word that helps you become in the present moment. So it could just be here and now. You could pick your dog's name, your kid's name. You could pick... Um, Whatever, gosh, there's so many different options. I'm trying to think of some of the examples my students have given me. Um, whoosh, so a student really liked that auditory connection of whoosh when the club sweeped through the grass, it created this nice sound of a whoosh. So as she would get out of the cart, pick her golf club and it's time to hit her shot, she would in her mind mentally say whoosh and that allowed her to be present in the moment and knowing the feel that she wanted to have moving into the golf ball. So the Q word can help motivate you, help redirect your attention. You're talking about a party on Friday night with your buddy and all of a sudden you need to hit a 50 yard piss shot. All of a sudden you're like, whoosh. Okay, now I know exactly what I need to do. And it just redirects you for that moment. As soon as you hit the shot, you can go back to talking about your party on Friday night. It just helps you redirect to the present moment. Yeah, that's great. It's, 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 that's, I think that's really great and just so, so simple to incorporate into your game like right away. That's really great. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, let us know. I'm apologizing. I'm seeing right now that uh, there was somebody that couldn't get the audio and then somebody that couldn't see the video. Um, that's on your end from my understanding going through GoToWebinar. Um, everything else is moving pretty, pretty well. So uh, this video will um, be sent out again. So, um, Dr. Kirk, I want to say thank you. This has been a really awesome um, start to talking about the mental side of golf. Um, you definitely um, want to be on the lookout for an email from Kira, and this, it'll have this recording uh, and a link um, to sign up for the continuation seminar, which will be next. Uh, next month. Uh, it'll be Performance of Golf, the, the part two series, um, Imagery, Goal Setting, and Focus and Concentration. So uh, this will take place on October 25th. Um, we hope to see you all there. Uh, your newsletter, uh, which we've been sending out after each uh, webinar, um, this one will come after the second webinar. It'll fly into your inbox um, in October after our chat with Dr. Kurt again, and hopefully there'll be some fall and going into winter recipes um, that we'll be able to add to it. Um, but again, thank you so much, Dr. Kurt. This has been awesome. I'm excited. I've, I've taken lots of notes. Um, the box breathing is something I think I'm going to work with with my, on my, with my children. I think that is a, a great way to get them um, in the moment and to relax, especially my son. Uh, and uh, I'm going to actually start teaching that as well um, in my instruction. So thank you so much. So You're very again, welcome. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for joining us. Um, and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you.